Um, this has been regarded as your maiden speech. You've been away such a long time that... Uh, Yeah, I, I made that speech. Time. I still can't. Uh, quite I, I made that, that 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 mistake um, at the mayor making. Well, Mr. Mayor, then we're all we're all capable. I still can't can't quite fathom that with an electorate one eighth the size uh, of when I was a member of parliament, the majority in Wandsworth Common is eight times what I had as a member of parliament, and I am honoured to be following in the footsteps of Morris Heaster. Cathy Tracy and Claire Clay, who served our ward and the residents of the whole borough with great distinction over many, many years. And the ward might have an obvious focus on the common, its biggest feature, and have only a dozen shops and one pub for our 10,000 electors. But we do have the borough's best garden centre, and opposite that, its biggest building with 1,500 possible voters, but of course none of them voted as they were an institution at Her Majesty's pleasure. And although this is my maiden speech as the councillor for Wandsworth Common, it's not the first time I've obviously spoken in this chamber. And as the councillor for St. Mary's Park Ward for eight years, I was first elected a quarter of a century ago before a calling took me to another place for my own brief sojourn, serving at Her Majesty's sorry, palace in Westminster, in another institution full of challenging and unreformed characters. But before members on the other side harumph about me having two bites at the maiden apple, it's worth explaining that I never was able to make my original maiden speech, Councillor Belton, because in 1994, the trades unions and the Labour group, which was then led by Councillor Belton, who I'm very pleased is still in his seat. And may I say that he in my opinion so far, has been arguably a more vocal and impressive leader than the current incumbent. But anyway, Councillor Belton and his team decide, well, you're only attacking Councillor Belton if you hiss that. <laughs> but Councillor Belton and his team decided to whip up public sentiment by saying they wanted the council to keep on running a care home in Battersea. Now, their rental mob of noisy lefty activists who I have to admit probably would have made momentum look like a bunch of choir boys. They were up in the gallery making a lot of noise. And they included a woman whose, Councillor Belton will remember her name, but her the first name is June. And she had, a, I'm afraid to say, a voice like a foghorn. The then Mayor, uh, the then Mayor Beryl Jeffries, had already put, a, put June on a final warning when I stood up to give my maiden speech. I got no more than one sentence in before the Mayor had had enough and all five feet of her bellowed, clear the chamber, and promptly suspended the whole sitting for the rest of the evening. <laughs> so the real result of that 1994 debate is that today, a quarter of a century later, that care home continues to thrive in the private sector. And Mr. Mayor, I remember serving with you when you were first elected as a fresh-faced councillor. Not that you're no longer fresh-faced, more that the weight of responsibility is so visibly added to your experience. <laughs> and in those heady days of council tax in London was 584 pounds, but in Wandsworth, it was a third of that at 172. And in 2019, stripping out the GLA, it will still be less than 40% of the London average. But at the same time, we have maintained strong reserves, which demonstrate that when the sun was shining, we kept our roof in perfect order. But our stewardship isn't just about how well we manage the council and keep taxes low, but how we look after, say, the staff pension fund. Figures show that Wandsworth's performance is laudable, up a third in three years, twice the performance of most other councils, in the top quartile, and 100% funded. We heard at FCROSS that the Labour Group think we should risk our capital reserves by playing the markets just like the gambler who hasn't realized why a casino stays in business. 
And in the same way that 25 years ago they couldn't fathom that the private sector can look after the borough's elderly, the party opposite, I'm afraid, can't tell us because they don't know how they would increase the return on our hard saved reserves without risking it all. The people of Wandsworth know that very well, which is why we are still entrusted to be the stewards of this great borough. Well, I thank Councillor Fluck for his fake maiden speech. Most interesting, times that have gone and been brought up to date, both with Councillor Fluke and, and the Council, I think. Councillor Leonie Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Mayor. So I'm going to give my maiden speech. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm actually not going to give my maiden speech. In fact, I never gave a maiden speech either when I was a Latchmere councillor, but um, I'm not going to give that tonight because I now represent Fursdown. What I am going to talk a little bit about, though, is um, the period 2006 to 8, when I was first elected onto this council, when we had the first mayor of London um, in City Hall, and we heard absolutely endlessly, and I'm sure Councillor ben Belton will um, remember this in great detail, endlessly from the party opposite about there was a shortage of a very precise number, 80 police officers, endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. Now, of course, uh, there was then a change to a different Mayor of London in 2008, and suddenly there was very little more to be heard about the shortage of police officers uh, or indeed any further attacks on the Mayor, certainly not in Wandsworth at Six or Brightside or any of the other places where the Mayor had previously been endlessly attacked. And indeed, from 2010, when the new government came in, um, first the coalition and now the Conservative-led uh, uh, government, um, there was uh, a series of attacks on police funding, which again, funnily enough, the opposition over there hadn't got very much to say about. Those 80 police officers that have vanished along with many, many more hmm, didn't really bear much of a mention. And who was the person who was uh, overseeing the cutting of all the money to the police? I think we all know her name. I think we know she's actually not a great friend of the previous Mayor of London. Maybe that was because she cut so much from his budgets between 2008 and 16. Maybe it was because when he went off and bought some water cannon, naughty Boris, she then said, well, you're not allowed to play with those water cannon on the streets of London. Because he'd been trying to big himself up and say, we need to, I need to go medieval on the pe people of London with the water cannon. Um, didn't hear too much complaints from the other side about that. This week, I actually had to rip up my speech because every single commentator, nearly all of them from the police, have been saying how massively underfunded the police service is in London and across the rest of the country. And do you know who agrees with that? The GLA Conservatives, because we have been sending cross-party letters to the Home Secretary, the last one, and the current one, saying we need more money in London for the police. Bernard Hergen Howe on Monday, we need 20,000 more officers. Cressida Dick on Tuesday, even going as far to say, when she was asked on LBC, what do you think about support from the army, saying, yes, I wouldn't say no, and saying that there is indeed a link between rising crime and the lack of police, and of course, other services, because that's the key to this. But then, of course, the Prime Minister, poor deluded Theresa May. Against all the evidence, she ploughs on, regardless, ignoring all the experts and all the evidence, insisting that she is right and everyone else is wrong. Sounds rather familiar, doesn't it? She seems to do that on every subject. What a mess she has created, because a lot of the cuts came from her in the first place as Home Secretary. She tries to deny any kind of responsibility. You try to deny any kind of responsibility. At least the GLA Conservatives have stood alongside Labour and the Mayor and demanded more police on our streets. Austerity is even forcing you to say, let's put council tax up. And that is not something I've often heard you talking about in this chamber. Really? Come on, come along. We've just, we've just heard a speech from uh, Councillor Flick, which he claims Mr. was his maiden speech. Councillor no, Cooper I'm sorry, I'm not me. taking any interruptions at all. This is austerity. This is being forced on the boroughs. It's being forced on the mayor. It's being forced on police and crime commissioners across this country. It's leading to blighted lives. It's leading to lives cut short from estates in Earlsfield to the back streets of Battersea and even just around the corner from me in Fursdown. The final absolute proof 
that we are not seeing enough funding coming into local government. Councillor Critchard was just talking about adult care services. We, could, we will probably talk about children's services and we're making cuts there as well, as you know. The final proof that not enough money is coming into our services here and, uh, and to London services and across the country is the fact that some councils are now starting to go bust and you are putting up council tax. Thank you. Councillor Binder, would you like to make your maiden speech, please? Thank you, Mr Mayor. And it's Councillor Binder, by the way. <laughs> Councillor Binder, would you like to make your maiden speech? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm Sarah Binder, um, <laughs> and I'm a new member of the uh, Council for East Putney. Um, as a customary for a new councillor, I wanted to say um, just a few words about my ward before moving on to some comments regarding... Um, the motion that's before us um, today, in particular around social care. When I was walking up Putney Hill for the first time six years ago to my then new boyfriend's flat, I also remember being at the bottom of a hill and thinking, that's a very long hill and I don't think we're going to live here for very long. <laughs> Fast forward six years, boyfriend is now the husband, I'm pushing a buggy up the hill after <laughs> attending rhyme time at Putney Library, but we're still, I'm still walking up the hill. <laughs> my point is, I don't think I imagined then, six years ago, that I would be standing here now representing the ward. It's a huge honour to represent the ward, and I, like I'm sure the rest of my colleagues do, take the responsibility of it to speak out on behalf of our residents really seriously. My family all live within the borough, in Thamesfield, in Queenstown, and Shaftesbury. Politically, we cover the full range of the political spectrum. While we agree on almost nothing in politics, we actually all agree on how great not only Wandsworth is as a place to live, um, but also how great Wandsworth Council is. I'm struck by that same passion for Wandsworth with my colleagues across the political spectrum here tonight, in this chamber, in the OSCs. We're all here because we feel passionate about this borough. We may disagree on what is best for residents, how or if things should be funded, and how services should be provided. But as a new councillor, I've been really struck by the commitment all of us feel to the borough. To turn to the matter at hand, it is simply a matter of reality that the, ad the cost of adult social care is rising across the country for one very simple reason. Those in need of social care are living longer. We should be celebrating this on every level, I think. Our children are more likely to know their grandparents and great-grandparents than we were. The number of people aged 85 will have more than doubled in 30 years to 2.1 million by 2030. Those born with disabilities that once would have dramatically shortened life expectancy and life quality can now live longer and more importantly more fulfilling lives thanks to medical technology and the sort of social care that we provide. Life expectancy for a person with Down syndrome has nearly tripled in my lifetime from 23 in 1983 to 60 in 2018. Like all societies we must adapt to the continuing changing needs of our communities and the evidence is overwhelmingly clear that more political and financial focus must be given to the requirements for social care and more importantly how it is paid for. There is no magic money tree. Social care is rising on average at 3.7% per year. In our borough alone there's going to be a 28% rise of the amount of people over, over 85 who are living in our borough by 2025. We, support, we spend £6 million supporting young people between the ages of 18 to 25 and there are, some, there are some 20 young adults who have serious disabilities who cost £800,000 per year. All of this needs to be funded and rightly should be funded. I continue to be amazed with the innovation that we see from our adult social care team here. Their focus on continuing to bespoke services to the individual um, through the recent contract tender while also encouraging personal independence where appropriate is really laudable. For an increase of £48 per annum to protect those in Wandsworth who need to support to live their lives fully, this would seem to me to be the definition of a no-brainer, and so I would recommend my colleagues to vote for it. <laughs> Councillor Binder, I congratulate you on maiden speech, which was the most interesting topographical um, description of East Putney, and um, your, your joy at uh, finding yourself representing it. And also, um, very interesting um, sort of mini dissertation about the need for social care funding. Councillor Birchall. Mr Mayor, how we spend not our money, 
but residence money in Wandsworth is extremely important. It must be targeted where it is most needed for efficient and effective spending. Spending on our young people is of paramount importance and saves money later on. Councillor McDermott is all, will it be telling us um, in her answers to her questions and the written answers that we've already got um, about the good things that are going on in children's services and how resources are being used to make the most of the money available. For example, the two units at St John Vasco School, Savio and Devereux Base, here the investment has been put into helping children with autistic spectrum. I have already seen the impact on young lives that this investment is making, while at the same time saving money on not having to bus children to out-of-borough schools or relying on private providers. The children's quality of life is also improving by being able to be educated nearer their homes. There are now several schools in the borough offering similar support to autistic spectrum children of all ages. There are some people who are up in arms about changes to children's centres. I would like to explain to you why this will be of benefit in the long term. Children not being school ready is a term that many of you might be familiar with. We are seeing a small yet significant minority of three-year-olds who are lagging behind their peers in physical and co cognitive development, but most importantly, in their language skills. Already, some of these children are a year behind. They start school on the back foot and never adequately catch up. At three, the brain size of the average child will be this size. The brain size of a child who lacks stimulation is this size. Hopefully, we don't have too many children with that sort of level of deprivation, but every ch toddler, um, some toddlers have less severe delay, it will be really beneficial for that child to receive help early. Some families find parenting a greater challenge than most. Some do not understand how to help their baby develop and the importance of talking to them. Some find bonding difficulty, difficult and therefore cannot nurture their baby. And some lack confidence in their own abilities. These are the families who we are trying to help in a more focused way by providing special play, uh, play in sessions at services like Franciscan Children's Centre, among the other centres across the borough. It would be hoped that these families will consider accepting a nursery place, which is on offer um, for five, 15 hours a week to some two-year-olds. This is part of the early years offer and is financed by the early years fund, which comes from central government. So win-win. The investment of time and resources now will result in savings to primary schools with children arriving better prepared to learn. But even more important, it is saving, this is a saving of that child from always underachieving. I would ask you all to support this proposal, show a little generosity towards these children and their families. Do not begrudge them the little of extra help and support from our excellent children's centre staff. Do not begrudge them the few hours of targeted help. I'm asking you to consider the well-being of the few because the many are going to be all right. It is with the help of the officers of children's services and all the staff employed across the different departments who are giving the best service to the children and families of Wandsworth. I'd like to thank them all. Thank you. Councillor Gibbons. Uh, point, point of order, Mr. Mayor, under section on standing order number 28. Uh, Councillor Hampton. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move that the council adjourn for 30 seconds.
Are we happy with that? No? <laughs> I'm afraid you're two minutes previous. Councillor Gibbons. I, but I very clearly, uh, Mr. Mayor, I very clearly. Councillor Gibbons. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, last May, Labour stood on a manifesto promise to keep council tax low, cleaner air, greener and safer neighbourhoods, and genuinely affordable homes for local people. And this was supported by more Wandsworth voters than the Conservative manifesto. So that's why we're sticking to our promise of a council tax freeze, because it's actually not right to ask those who are struggling to pay more. Nothing has changed since last May. In fact, things have got worse economically. Many people are trapped in low pay and low hours jobs on the gig economy. Many people have had their wages frozen still. The lowest paid people pay six times more council tax proportionally than the highest paid. In Wandsworth, in the first nine months of uh, the 2018 year, there were 14% fewer startups than in the same period last year. But Wandsworth Food Bank use jump, has jumped from 1,500 to 2,600 in the period between 2011 to 2018. The fact is that we are entering a period of Brexit economic shock. The CBI's measure of private sector growth dropped 3% uh, in February from a zero position in January. Wandsworth is stuck in a financial fiscal box. It's always cultivated the myth of an economic miracle created by good management of resources. But actually the truth is, for many, many years, Wandsworth was dependent on government handouts. Council tax makes up about 5% of the to council's total expenditure, and the maximum rise we can achieve is about 1.5 million. Council tax has actually co almost completely lost its financial significance as a method of raising money. But what we do know, heading down the tracks, is that the government's new financial formula for funding for local government will be absolutely ruinous for Wandsworth. It's taking money out of government, uh, out of London, and distributing it to the wealthy Tory shires. This is so, such an appalling situation that this Tory council has actually suggested in its response to the fair funding review that we should lift the council tax cap to allow far bigger increases in council tax without a referendum if the government uses a notional average council tax as the basis for the formula for allocation of resources. In other words, we are now seeing a Tory council arguing for large hikes in council tax in the future. Now, we believe in sound financial management not gambling money away in Icelandic banks, as uh, former councillor Russell King may have done at some point. Um, we agree with a better investment policy. Um, longer term government and commercial bonds at good fixed rates. We have three investment fund managers who actually have a job all day to sort out um, the financial affairs of the council. We set the parameters as councillors at OSC and through the council. We do not make the day-to-day -day investment decisions and that's how we do business. No one seriously believes that Peter Graham, despite the fact he dresses like a city slicker from the 1980s, <laughs> right? Or Councillor Melanie Hampton, who keeps telling us that she's a businesswoman, and I'm sure she is, a very good businesswoman. But we do not want, we, she will not be making day-to-day -day financial decisions about which funds we invest in. And Mr. Overspend, Councillor Senior, would they be the right people to be making the individual investment decisions on a day-to-day -day basis on behalf of this council? Most certainly not. It would be as absurd as Councillor Govindia cutting out council officers and taking charge of planning decisions himself. And that would never happen. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, point of personal explanation. Councillor Govindia, have you been mentioned? I think I have been mentioned, and Councillor Gibbons knows perfectly well that I have never, never taken charge of making planning decisions and left it entirely and always quite properly to the planning officers. I must have been mistaken about the reports I'd read.